The views expressed, opinions given, and any communication made between the hosts and guests of What Are You Afraid of Horror and Paranormal Show do not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of Para-X Radio, EMC Network, or all services that play this show. The hosts and services are not responsible for the actions of their guests, and the original rights of all intellectual property is retained by the creator, and all work is used with either permission or Creative Commons license. The show is for entertainment purposes only. I'm horror author T. Fox Dunham. And I'm horror author and filmmaker Phil Thomas. And tonight we're asking you... What are you afraid of? Wait a minute, I know you. I know you too. You're Phil Thomas. Yes. You're the T- author. You're T-Fox Dunham. The and author. the filmmaker. The author. Yes. Oh, where? Yes. oh, God, who would want to be an author? <laughs> horrible, horrible idea. No, but I know you, and, um, you know, you used to do a show with me. Yeah. Yeah, what was that called? Oh, um, get a job. Something. Yeah, that, that's, that, that's what it was. <laughs> get a real job, get a real hippie. Job. Yeah. <laughs> it was called, what are you, uh, when are you getting a real job? Yeah, that's and a haircut. Called. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, it's uh, yeah. That was no, a good show. What are you afraid of? Yeah, I think that's it was. what it was. I'm afraid of getting a real job. <laughs> that's what it was. <laughs> what are you afraid of? That's well, in the, and that, uh, that's a good answer. Yeah. I'm afraid of getting a real job. Well, you got sick. I did. You had that yeah, nasty yeah. flu, and oh. it ended up in your lungs. Yeah. And then I wasn't feeling well, and timing really um, got away from us. It did. And I just ended up uh, doing some interviews, which were good. Yeah. I mean, I enjoyed talking to Katrina Weidman. Of course, I. Tony Knighton came on, right? one of the authors in A Time for Violence, which is an anthology coming out from Close to the Bone. It'll be out on May 1st. You can pre-order it now, and it's got some amazing crime noir dark authors in it. Um, just So he's in that one, I'm in that one, Andrew Rausch is in, Andy Rausch is in that one, and of course Chris Roy, who was on the show, and we'll be talking to some of the other authors from that in the next couple of months. Um, some authors from Australia, some living in North, you know, North Korea, Vietnam, um, some, so that's going to be a lot of fun. We're kind of doing the noir thing. But how are you? I'm good now. Good. I'm all yeah. better. Yeah, you are all better. I'm all better. No took more. you a while. Yeah, it took a while. It was a couple of weeks, mm-hmm. you know, and um, I was on antibiotic. Right. And, uh, you know, it's, you know, I, I just all of a sudden one day got this tickle in my throat and this nasty cough started coming on me. And that was it. And as, and as soon as it happened... I was like, oh man, I'm done for. Because like, yeah, I've, I've had this happen before, mm-hmm. and that's the first thing, that's the first symptom dun, dun, that occurs. Dun, 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 yeah. And uh, the second day was real fun because I literally coughed like every 30 yeah. seconds. Yeah. Like, that's not even an exaggeration. So, <laughs> that was, yeah. It was bad. It yeah. just, it tortures you. Yeah. It does. Like my book, Mercy. <laughs> illnesses. Illness is a personal thing. Yeah, it, but, it really is. And, and I know you weren't feeling well either. It's been a year. Yeah. It's been a year. Right. Um, but we're here now doing what we do. That's right. Now, this is episode 113, and we're going to be talking about some cool stuff that... Well, it's not cool. It's actually kind of scary. But, it's, you know, that's what we do. It's, it's cool. It's cool scary. It's, it's, it's yeah, cool scary. It's scary cool. It's cool scary, scary cool. <laughs> now, this episode's called Folk Devils and Moral Panic. Yeah. And if anybody has been following the trends in the media, you know, for the last, say, 300 years, <laughs> you know all about moral panic. But right. now we, I think the best example that we've covered about moral panic is clown news. Yeah, yeah. This is kind of That's clown news. huge one. This yeah. is kind of clown news, so we're going to play the jingle. Clown news. There we go. Yeah. I love the jingle. I love we, the jingle. Because it's done. The clown news is done. They've moved on to other things. Yep, yep. <laughs> Uh, the big thing is Momo. 
Mm, right. You're familiar with Momo. You've seen it. Yes. I'm sure everyone's seen the picture. Right. This horrifying picture of this lady with big eyes, a bird-like face. She has breasts hanging down and rooster-like legs. Yeah. You've seen it. I have seen it, yeah. I'm not sure exactly what to make of it, though. Well, actually, it was a sculpture titled Mother Bird, okay. which was made by the artist Kazuki Osawa for the Japanese special effects company Link Factory. Oh, okay. And a picture was taken of it, put on Instagram, and it got borrowed. Ah. And slowly, this folk culture, this urban legend, evolved around this horrifying statue that no one knew the origin of. And it started showing up on people's phones. Um, this, yeah. this app called WhatsApp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Now, this thing was, um, this was called the Momo Challenge. Mm-hmm. And you've heard of the Momo Challenge. I've heard of the Momo Challenge, yes. And on this WhatsApp, kids were supposedly getting Momo. She would appear. Apparently, they were, their accounts were hacked. Okay. And they were told they had to do these challenges. And if they didn't, they were shown these horrifying scenes of what would happen to them. <laughs> and these challenges usually led up to acts of defiance, vandalism, self-mutilation, and it was supposed to end in suicide. Wow. Wow. Jeez. That's, that's well, that, that doesn't, I mean, I mean, the person who did that, person or people who yeah. did that, um... You know, if they want the person uh, to commit suicide, yeah, or some or something bad's going to happen to you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so if you don't kill yourself, something yeah. bad's going to wait. What? <laughs> yeah, you see, it doesn't even make sense when yeah, you think yeah, about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But see, you got to kill yourself, or something bad's going to happen. Bad's going to happen to you. What? Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't even make sense. It doesn't even make sense. Exactly. But yeah. the thing was. Uh, Kids, little kids were supposedly vulnerable to this thing. Of course they are, yeah. They believe stuff like that. They weren't socially um, equipped to handle it. Mm-hmm. And parents freaked out. And they were all, like, looking at their kids' phones. And, you know, um, it, it started apparently in Argentina and India, where mm-hmm. these reports were coming out saying mm-hmm. that, that Momo actually led to suicides. And the game wow. proliferated on WhatsApp, you know. And, of course, it's a popular messaging app by kids and adults in those countries. And There's something shady about WhatsApp. I, I yeah. never trusted it. I yeah, never it, installed it. I never wanted to use it. It's the new lead of um, cybersecurity, again, creating these ideas that we're leaving all these conversations on file mm-hmm. that can be accessed by the government or by conspiracy people. Mm-hmm. And now the new thing is creating chat apps that leave no record. Right. So you can't get in trouble for what you say. In fact, yeah. Facebook's doing it. Right. But um, a lot of mob murders were apparently inspired by this thing. In really? India and Argentina, and oh it got more and more popular as internet memes do. Mm-hmm. And then uh, Mrs. Kardashian put up a post about it, warning everybody that and vaccines, I guess. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that was it. Um, and it was crazy. Everybody was like, oh, "What's going on with my kid's phone? I don't have control over it." Yeah, you know. You know what it reminds me of? It's it's like a chain a chain letter yeah. for the digital age. There you go. Yeah, yeah. You know, remember. You, when you were in high school or in grade school and, and you would be walking down the hall I don't know if it's ever happened to you personally but you're walking down the hall and then someone would just hand you a paper and you look yeah. at it oh it's a chain letter oh as a kid you I know? sent them out oh you did send I them out I would get okay. one and I, I just thought it was fun yeah yeah right. I thought it was a neat way of connecting to people and, right. and getting you know and I sent them out and I didn't really understand them at the time right <laughs> and of course those kind of things lead to pyramid schemes they do yeah. you know or you you send a dollar and everyone sends in a dollar and then two dollars <laughs> and some MLM uh, ice, right, ice, right. Uh, yeah it's, it's, it's one of those things where, um, you know, if you pass out a chain letter, you know, I'd say maybe 90%, especially if they're kids, mm-hmm. will believe it. If I don't do this, yeah. I got one too that said, uh, I forget something. If you don't do this, if you don't make copies of this and send it to, you know, make and pass out 10 copies, mm-hmm. then this, this is going to happen to you, you know? Mm-hmm. So, right. Um, I never, actually, you never, I don't remember if I even ever did it or not. <laughs> no, good for you. I just did it for fun. I thought it was yeah. a neat way to talk to people. I didn't realize there was so much um, hysteria attached to them. Oh, yeah, yeah. But but Momo is considered what is called a folk devil. Okay, yeah. That's the source of the moral panic. And we've been covering clown news. And clown news was the moral panic it was. of like 2017. Yeah, yeah. These clown sites. It was huge. Yeah. And again, when the whole thing is analyzed, nothing can be um, explained. There's no proof. And again, there's no proof that any kid harmed themselves based on the Momo thing. Right. 
you know, she was apparently being edited into videos, and, and apparently somebody heard this and did it a few times. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't that they created the myth, it's that the myth inspired them to do it. Right. But it's crap. It is. It's yeah. all crap. It is. Now, um... It's a product of a sculpture, right? Or yeah, it's, it's the sculptor. It's yeah. Mother Bird. Right. By artist um, Kisuka Asawa. And we talked about the Slender Men. Slender Men, yeah. That was another one. That was another one. Except for that one. And that one actually led to two girls killing somebody. Yeah, right. <clears throat> so, I mean, there is there is some fear in this, this hysteria that, that happens when these folk culture and urban culture things... And the idea is that a threat to society is seen... In some sort of mass communication device, mm -hmm. which used to be the rumor in books, letters, and now it's social media. Yep. And then everyone freaks out. Yeah. And has to stop. And of course, I played Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. And that was the big moral panic. Right. And of course... Um, it was. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that. People... You know, I had a newspaper article go up one time, and people were actually coming to the comic book shop to watch it and try to stop us if we <laughs> did something terrible. Huh. And they're like, are you worshipping the devil? And we're like, yeah, we're worshipping the devil. Okay, roll the d6. Your sword hits the dragon. He has a magic potion for you. You know? <laughs> yeah, it, it, there was this huge outcry from parents uh, in the in the 80s, mm -hmm. um, were they thinking that Dungeons and Dragons was satanic. Yeah. And, um, and of I, course, Christian groups got very upset about it because it's use of magic. Christ, and, yeah, Christian groups. I mean... Okay, first of all, I mean, it's not real magic. It's, no, of course it's a, not. It's a game. Yeah, it's <laughs> okay. like video games. You know, it, it, it comes down to this. They just don't... They're, they're getting upset over something they don't understand. Yeah, and that something frightens them. That maybe they actually did some research on it, you know, and Kids, actually figured out yeah. what it was about. Kids are always involved. It's always some threat to their children they don't understand. And I read right. someone say that really this is about the fear that the last generation always feels when they feel, feel themselves losing control mm -hmm. as the next generation takes power. Uh -huh. And that, that's really what it's about. But we'll be back to talk about moral panic in a few minutes. Um, I've got part three of a ghost story that I researched and wrote about the Bellroy Mansion in Chestnut Hill, Philadelphia, right here in Chestnut Hill, where, mm -hmm. where my wife works, well, currently. Um, and it's it's an intense ghost story about all these happenings at the Bellroy Mansion. And we did part one and part two. David Walton recorded these for us. And this is the Blue Room and the Chair of Death at the Bellroy Mansion on What Are You Afraid Of? Horror and Paranormal Show on ParaX Radio. And you can find our website at www.whatareyouafraidofpodcast.com. What are you afraid of? Hi, I'm Tim Wagner, Bram Stoker Award-winning author. Hashtag Grave Girls. This is Katrina Weidman of Destination America's Paranormal Lockdown. This is Jim Chambers. I'm the author of The Engines of Sacrifice. This is Jasper Barr, award-winning author of The Final Cut. And you're listening to What Are You Afraid Of? What Are You Afraid Of? To What Are You Afraid Of? What Are You Afraid Of? Love it. Fan fan toxic, please. Fan toxic. The Blue Room and the Chair of Death. From the Bailroy Mansion, located in Chestnut Hill, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, USA. Researched and written by T. Fox Dunham. Read by David Walton. The Bailroy Mansion has been called one of the most haunted houses in America, and after researching the property from a variety of books of ghost stories, online websites, and even seeing the property during my visits to the gorgeous neighbourhood of Chestnut Hill in Philadelphia, I can see why the house is so popular as a source for paranormal tales. So far, I have covered the ghost of the younger brother, Stephen, who saw the image of a skull looking back at him when he looked at his reflection in a fountain's water. Three weeks later, Stephen died, and his spirit continued to interrupt parties and gatherings for as long as the Mead Easby family resided in the mansion, including knocking his portrait 15 feet across the floor in the family gallery. The previous owner, an old crone, accosts people on the second floor with her cane. A number of housekeepers have died on the property, the ghost of Henrietta, George Easby's mother, was said to roam the corridors, offering advice 
and protecting her only surviving son, George Jr. Ghost cars race up the long and narrow driveway, only to vanish before the eyes of witnesses. Shadow figures haunt the halls, and strange knocks and footfalls sound through the house with no logical cause. Some have even seen the ghost of Thomas Jefferson, though he never visited the mansion, having died long before it was built. George Easby owned several artefacts that once belonged to the late president. The son of George and Henrietta, he lived in the house until his death in 2005. George Jr. made peace with the spirits, inviting them to indefinitely stay on the property. Special stories and history come from homes like the Belroy Mansion. The mansion was built in 1911, but bought by George Meade, descendant of the famed hero of the American Civil War Battle of Gettysburg, and this is where they came to spend their lives. Tragedy happened when Stephen died of an unnamed illness, a common thing in the early 1900s. The family either living or dead, would occupy the mansion until 2005, when George Jr. died. The domestic partnership was not respected by the extended family, and the house was eventually sold to a private family. Its many antiques were also sold or donated to museums. With George's death, the saga of the Mead Easby family in Belroy Mansion ended, leaving neighbourhood legends of the many ghosts of Bailroy. Many of the stories from the Bailroy mansion tell of harmless encounters. The ghosts just seem to want a little attention, or to communicate something to their relatives. The ghost of young Stephen played pranks, and wanted to be remembered during dinner parties and other visitations often appearing to workers during construction on the property. It must be hard watching your family grow up without you, so we can all feel for Stephen. George Easby, son of George and Henrietta, lived many years in the house with his domestic partner, missing his family. George's mother, Henrietta, dwelled in the house long after her death, protecting her son from bad financial dealings, and helping him to find unknown inheritances and treasures in the attic. Before he died, George Easby Jr. reported that the ghost of his mother brought him to an antique desk. Inside one of the drawers, he found a letter written by his father, in which his father wrote, I was brought up not to believe in ghosts, and to trust only what science could explain. However, I have seen the ghosts, and there is no reason to be afraid. Housekeepers continued to clean, and Thomas Jefferson stopped by to visit his things. Ghosts were something the family just learned to live with. The family didn't believe in spirits before, but they all became believers after repeated encounters with the other side. Life existed side by side with death and there was nothing to fear. Well, nothing except for the blue room and the death chair. Don't sit in this cursed chair. On the second floor of the Bailroy mansion, you can find an 18th century drawing room that houses secret compartments, beautiful furniture often overlooked, and an innocuous looking chair upholstered with blue fabric and a flowery pattern. The Blue Room, as it came to be known, houses sterling silver that was used as a celebration dinner attended by the signers of the Declaration of Independence. Though not much is known about the history of the chair or the room in which it resides, it is said that the chair belonged to an angry spirit named Amelia or Amanda. For the purposes of this ghost story, we shall call her Amelia. Darcy Ewart, in her well-written and researched book, Haunted Philadelphia, 
said the following about the chair. A death chair should be black and made of iron or steel, not blue and upholstered with large yellow and red flowers. But then, you shouldn't judge a chair by its cover. The wing-backed chair looks normal, even comfy, but has a terrifying history and has been named the death chair. The Mead Easby family owned many antiques, such as the possessions of Thomas Jefferson, though the history of this special chair cannot be confirmed. The chair is said to be at least two centuries old, and rumour claims that it belonged to Emperor Napoleon, though that is probably false. The chair that belonged to the short conqueror of Europe was described in a Philadelphia Enquirer article in July 1991 as a red satin chair bearing a Napoleonic emblem. Who knows, perhaps this was part of a set. In ghost stories, all that matters is the legend anyway. The chair probably belonged to the ghostly lady associated with the furniture, the spirited we shall call Emilia. George called this ghost a loose cannon and believed she was not a mentally well spirit, the only malevolent presence to haunt the mansion. She ripped open doors just to slam them in rage and had a wicked nature who not only appeared as a blue mist but also a red vapour that hung in the doorway from the reception room into the blue room. Amelia spent her afterlife years haunting people following them home and compelling them to sit in her antique death chair. Once they sat in the chair, they were under her power. The family and visitors knew when the spirit was present because a blue mist materialised in the drawing room, which is how the chamber got its name. The blue mist has even been known to follow people home and cause them misfortune. In one incident, a friend of the family, Lloyd Gross, helped set up the mansion for a charity benefit. While getting ready, he noticed blue miasma just through the blue room doors. He told George Easby about it, blaming the strange fog on colder temperatures. George was quite clear with him, this was no fog, it was ectoplasm. What's ectoplasm? You haven't seen the classic paranormal comedy, Ghostbusters? So the Oxford Dictionary defines ectoplasm as a supernatural viscous substance that is supposed to exude from the body of a medium during a spiritualistic trance and form the material for the manifestation of spirits. According to Wikipedia, ectoplasm, from the Greek ektos, meaning outside, and plasma, meaning something formed or moulded, is a term used in spiritualism to denote a substance or spiritual energy exteriorized by physical mediums. It was coined in 1894 by psychical researcher Charles Richet. This material is excreted as a gauze-like substance from orifices on the medium's body and spiritual entities are said to drape this substance over their non-physical body, enabling them to interact in the physical and real universe. So this was blue gaseous ectoplasm formed by the presence of the ghost, Amelia. The story doesn't stop there for poor Lloyd Gross. The ghost of Amelia attached herself to poor Lloyd. That's what he gets for helping charity. Feeling disturbed, Lloyd decided to get out of there and head home. As he walked to his car, someone hit him on the shoulder. He figured it was George and quickly turned around to confront his friend, but George was too far away to have reached Lloyd, and he was the only one out there at the time. Lloyd Gross got home and walked into his foyer to find the same blue vapour wafting through the place. He thought the place was on fire, but could find no source of the miasma. 
Eventually, the blue vapour dissipated, but on a later night, something woke him up from a deep sleep. Someone sat on the edge of his bed and gripped his arm so tightly that it left bruises. When Lloyd woke and turned on the light, he found no one there. Lloyd got off easy. Others have encountered Amelia's ghost and suffered a fate far worse than some blue slime. The ghost tries to get people to sit in her chair, and if you do, you're fair game. If you sat in her chair, in her presence, so the story goes, you died. This is how the chair got the moniker, the death chair. It is said that four people who sat in the death chair have died. The Chestnut Hill Historical Society corroborates three deaths. George Easby told the Chestnut Hill Patch that his housekeeper, cousin and friend all died within weeks of sitting in the chair, which could still be a coincidence. It's not like Amelia reached through the fabric and ripped out their hearts. The friend who died was also employed by George Easby, a Paul Kimmons. Paul had worked at the mansion for several years and had never experienced anything paranormal. He was sceptical about all the ghost stories, but believed it was all fancy and rumours. Then George asked Paul Kimmons to escort psychic Judith Haynes through the mansion. Judith was one of the mediums who has worked to understand the paranormal mysteries of the Bailroy mansion, through readings, investigations and seances. When Judith Haynes first entered the mansion, she said, My God, I can't believe how many spirits are in this house. Because he didn't believe in the paranormal history of the mansion, George believed that Paul would make a suitable tour guide for the medium. During that tour, Paul first spotted Amelia floating down the stairway. Paul was not a believer in the paranormal, but the sight of the blue gaseous spirit descending above the stairs unnerved him. Paul Kimmons didn't mention this during the tour, but according to psychic Judith Haynes, he later called her to tell her that as he drove home from the mansion, he looked in his rearview mirror and saw the ghost of Amelia sitting in his back seat. So the spirit liked to follow people home, not just a creepy ghost, but a stalker. Amelia tormented poor Paul by appearing everywhere he went. She started waking him up in the middle of the night, and Paul would find the blue spirit floating over his bed. She never left him alone following him when he was shopping or meeting him at work. He couldn't eat or sleep and eventually grew sick and exhausted. Finally, George found Paul slumped over in Amelia's chair in the blue room, collapsed from exhaustion. He died soon after. Legend even has it that the chair was made by an evil warlock in the 18th century though this can't be confirmed and is probably fiction, but a fun horror story. George did learn that he could appease Amelia's spirit by draping a cord over her chair so no one would sit in it. George kept out of the blue room whenever she made her presence known. No one is sure where the ghost of Amelia came from or why she was so full of rage. It almost sounds like the story of a game or some curse. She could scare you, but she could only kill you if you sat in her chair. Of course, people died weeks later, and many of George's friends were older or perhaps subject to suggestion, and George was full of suggestive stories. And was Amelia connected to the room or the chair? No one's sure what became of the chair after the antiques from the house were sold off or donated to museums. The chair was valuable, so someone probably bought it. Does that mean Amelia is appearing in her usual blue incohate form somewhere else? How long until we hear these new stories? So if you're a fan of the show and you own the chair, let us know. 
And thank you for listening to What Are You Afraid Of? Horror and Paranormal Show. We are a dark magazine giving our audience their weekly feel of spooky and we're glad you enjoy our program. Relax, have a drink. Just don't sit back in the blue wing backed chair when listening unless of course you're recording it to have your heirs send it into the show. The story was researched by horror author T. Fox Dunham from several sources of documented haunting in Philadelphia. His sources Haunted Philadelphia by Darcy Wood The Chestnut Hill Patch The Philadelphia Inquirer Various online websites Haunted Houses USA The works of Mark Nesbitt and local interviews The stories have not been plagiarised and the original writing of the authors has been respected. Written for What Are You Afraid Of? Horror and Paranormal Show, listen on Para-X Radio at 9pm Eastern Standard Time on Friday nights. Download from a variety of major podcast sites such as iTunes, iHeart and Google Play, plus more, and at our website at www.whatareyouafraidofpodcast.com All one word Where you can find our archive of episodes Articles on paranormal and horror writing subjects And our collection of ghost stories Each with a narrator reading the story And if you have had an encounter with a ghost Please contact us so we can share your story Guidelines are available on the website at www.whatareyouafraidofpodcast.com Hi, I'm David Walton and I drop whatever I'm doing to read whatever Fox and Phil demand of me. My digital, as opposed to ectoplasmic alter ego, is called Brendan Shawland, who regularly plays guitar and sings in a virtual world. Brendan has a website, David doesn't. Bandcamp sales figures would suggest that Brendan's music is decidedly niche. If you want to be in the vanguard of support as Brendan heads towards global domination, just put Brendan Shawland in your favourite search engine and you'll find his website very close to the top. You'll see what the human looks like and you can check out the Listen to a Song page to access Brendan's unwillingly private world of creative output. Mercy, a new horror medical thriller from author T. Fox Dunham published by Bloodbound Books. Based on the author's horrific battle with a rare form of lymphoma that involved intense chemotherapy and radiation, Fox turns the horror of his experience into terror on the page. William Sane is dying of cancer. On most days, death seems like a humane alternative to the treatment. Stricken with fever, William is rushed to mercy, notorious as a place to send the sickest of the poor and uninsured to be forgotten, and finds the hospital in even worse condition than his previous visit. Willie's memories faded. He grabbed his sack head, the sack head of the scarecrow, picking at the exposed chicken wire to hold them in. However, the memories fell out of the holes in his face. They wormed and crawled from the leather flesh and the old clothing of the scarecrow, then squirmed and wiggled down his body. The grounds are unkempt, the foundation is cracking, and like the wild mushrooms sprouting from the fissures of decay around it, something is growing inside the hospital. Something dark. Fangoria gives Mercy 3.5 out of 4 skulls. Dunham has channeled his many brushes with the other side into the exquisitely rendered lyrical supernatural hospital thriller Mercy. It's feeding on the sickness and sustaining itself on the staff, changing them. And now, it wants Willie. Come now, Mr. Saint. Just a little more of that sweet mail. (laughs) So salty and so good. You won't miss it. And we ever do so like our delicacies here at Mercy Hospital. Part medical horror, part supernatural suspense, Mercy is a hard-hitting fever dream of the novel. I enjoyed the hell out of it.
Tim Wagner, author of The Way of All Flesh and Eat the Night. Available from Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and bookstores everywhere in both print and digital versions. Life is an addiction. Let go. Let it all burn. Demons. Vampires. Werewolves. Skinwalkers. All of this and more. Sunday nights at midnight. On the Staring into the Abyss radio show. Come, get lost with us. <laughs> it's a neat story. That's yeah, really cool. The Bellroy Mansion. Yeah. Um, I did a lot of research on it. I rewrote the stories. And there's so much material. I could have written a book on it. And it's still out there in Chestnut Hill. It has new owners. The new, the new owners have complained of ghost stories. But don't go knocking on their door. Respect your privacy. <laughs> right. You right. know? Yes, absolutely. But thank you, David Walton. Thank you. For that wonderful reading. Always reads well. But we're talking about Momo. Yes, we're we talking are. about Moral Panic. This yeah. is episode 113, Folk Devils and Moral Panic. And we're talking about D&D. And, of course, I think the original Moral Panic goes back to the Salem witch trials, at least in America. Mm-hmm. But if you go back even further, there's always been and been tales of, of Moral Panic, except it was word of mouth right. at one time. Right. And, of course, there was the satanic craze of the 1980s. And you were reading a book on that. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's not specifically on that, mm-hmm. but it's there's elements uh, that are talked about. Uh, it's Grady Hendrix, Paperbacks mm-hmm. from Hell. Okay. And we, he basically talks about the origin of these these paperbacks that, you know, kind of came out of the 60s and 70s. They started mm-hmm. in the 60s. Um, and, you know, there was a lot of, um, you know, gothic uh, type of, like, knights and heroes and things mm-hmm. like that. Yeah, okay. And, and damsels and castles. And that was the horror, you know, the horror. And he explains how the horror was stuck in, like, the 30s at that mm-hmm. point. Yeah, 30 years later in the 60s, you know? And it wasn't until, really, uh, Rosemary's Baby came out that everything changed. You okay. Because horror was uh, looked at as being a kid's, you know, uh, favorable for kids and not for adults. They wouldn't even put horror on a book. They would call it, like, eerie tales or stuff like that. They would never use the word mm-hmm. horror. Yeah, okay. You like know? dark fiction, eerie right. tales, Twilight Zone. Right. So um, just uh, just to briefly explain it, so there's, like, the holy, the unholy trilogy, mm-hmm. as he explains it, which is which started with The Exorcist. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, we started with Rosemary's Baby. Okay. And then Exorcist and The Others. The Others. <clears throat> Those are the Unholy Trilogy. And that changed everything. And then, you know, um, everything after that was satanic. Okay. You know, all the, all the follow up books. You know, where all the follow up books were like had to have the devil on it. Even if the mm-hmm. even if the main plot was something else, the, the, Satan had to be worked in there somewhere. I mean, like like to cover the Amity Pool horror had a devil on it. Yeah, and there was not really anything yeah, about it, exactly. Well, it was a little bit, but yeah. And it was from those tre- from it. It all stems from that trend of mm-hmm. the unholy trilogy. So that's why the Amity Pool was so horror, right? So popular, yeah, it, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And um, and even like even books you never heard of or stories mm-hmm. you never heard of. Um, kind of stems from that, but everything had devil on the cover and everything. Okay. And, and I think this culminated, you know, I mean, there's no way of saying for sure, but I think this kind of culminated to like the, the satanic panic of like that moved into the 80s, yeah. you know? Yeah, I remember um, it. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I remember going down to different parks and seeing pentagrams everywhere mm-hmm. and like Satan, blah, blah, blah. But it wasn't Satan worship. It, it, it was kids. It was kids. Yeah. It was kids just being idiots. But the parents would freak out. <laughs> they would not see it like that. They would, yeah. they would be, this is a, this is a big deal. This, there's, there's, they're sacrificing animals. Yeah, they're sacrificing birds. And... They're going to take our kids. Right. That was the big thing. They're going to take our kids and torture it. And, and other things like um, the pedophilia craze. Right. Where there were armies of pedophiles living in basements and they were going to come out <laughs> during storms and steal children down. <laughs> just like witches taking children to yeah. eat. You know what the funny thing is? They don't eat. They don't sleep. They just wait in the basement. They just wait in the basement. They just wait in the basement. That's yeah. all they do. You that's, know, and, they then hibernate, and then as soon as the storm comes, ah. they're out. Ah. That, that creepy <laughs> character from Family Guy. Oh, oh. <laughs> that horrible character drives me crazy. Oh, which one? The uh, the old the old guild pedophile. Oh yeah. God, um, Mr. Herbert. Mr. Herbert. Yeah, yeah. weird, but weird area. He is a very creepy character. I I don't know why they still use him. He makes you uncomfortable. Yeah, I'm very uncomfortable with that character. Yeah. But yeah, that there it is. And so you're talking about that uh, that explosion of, and then of course it changed into D and D craze. Rock music craze, yeah, every, more moral panic. All metal bands were satanic, according to uh, you know religious groups. Yeah, and, um, even though 
you know, I was playing, course, if they you play the records backwards, it's like, like, message like and... Kiss. Everyone said Kiss stood for Knights and Satan service. Yeah. It's like, no, right. nothing to do <laughs> with Kiss. And it's funny, the metal, they called it heavy metal back then, but the metal you listen to now, you're like, this is just classic rock. It's nothing. Yeah. Like, like the speed metal. Right. Updated. Well, Moral Panic, according to Stanley Cohen, it starts with someone or something, a group are defined as a threat to social norms or community interests. The threats depicted a simple recognizable, recognizable symbol or form like Momo. Uh, the symbol rouses public concern. There's a response from authorities. The moral panic issues results in social changes within the community. And apparently it's this process that happens. Mm-hmm. And, and we're seeing it again. Of course, I'm a big folklore, um, not an expert, but a scholar, and right. urban legends. And of course, you know, you, you hear things like people eat 10 spiders in the course of their lives. Right. Because it apparently crawls into your mouth when you're sleeping. <laughs> but no, it doesn't happen. Right. Or the story of a roach crawling into someone's ear. And then, of course, you go to more scary stories to tell in the dark. And mm. like the story of the um, the Mexican chihuahua that turned out to be a giant rat. Oh, man. You know, you know what I'm talking about. You know what? I can see where they could be confused. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Mexican chihuahua and a rat. <laughs> and then, of course, these things happen. Um Another example in the 1950s was switchblades. Oh yeah, everyone had switchblades. Switchblades, yeah. Like if you and if you watch movies like Rebel Without a Cause, Twelve Angry Men, which I was favorite. The greasers had the switchblades. It was all this switchblade. Every evil gang had to have a switchblade, right? And people considered switchblades to be the epitome of evil. Right. Of course, they they had no idea they'd be living in a society today where where gun shooting deaths are normal. Yeah. And for the fifties to have switchblades, it's pretty tame compared. Yeah. To, they didn't walk around with guns. It's amazing how how far we've come. Yeah, it wasn't even that long ago. Well, it was, but yeah, right. Yeah. Was, <laughs> not for our parents. It was, but it wasn't. Yeah. yeah, but that's but that's the moral panic, and it's an interesting topic of conversation. Of course, we did clown news, but moral panic. There you go. Yeah, it's it's a, it's a real thing. But again, um, I want to tell everyone about a time for violence. I'm pushing this book a lot. I'm in it. And it's just a great book of noir and crime stories. I would call it the debut noir book of 2019. Okay. And you can find links up to it at the website at www.whatareyouafraidofpodcast.com. And it's got some incredible authors. Okay. Who's who's in it? Um, Kai Kismar. Okay. All right. And him and his son are in it. Oh, wonderful. And um, Russo, one of the producers of Night Living Dead, has a story in it. Chris Matherson has a story in it. And, of course, uh, Isabel Blackthorne. She's a fantastic gothic Australian author that I had the chance to interview. And that'll actually be out in the next show. She will, we'll have an interview up for her on episode 114 whenever we get to it. Right. <laughs> the way things are going. <laughs> well, hopefully we're back on track now. I think so. Yeah. I think so. Though, though we, we, should, we should look into expanding things or changing. Uh, we'll figure it out. Just, right. we, we tell so many ghost stories. Right. You know. <laughs> right. And we had we've had a wonderful couple of episodes, and it's getting warm finally. It's starting to. The yeah. last couple of days have been a bit warm. Yeah, yeah. I look forward to fishing and, and getting out and you know doing some gardening finally, yeah, right? And maybe some cooking. But being outside, grilling, and, and yeah, being just being outside, you know, enjoying the weather and and playing D and D and playing D and D, right? No, outside, <laughs> yeah, outside. We used to do that. Yeah. Now we had a great D and D setting called Ravenloft. Oh, right, right. And um, it's it's basically your gothic horror world. Okay. And I used to really get into it. Like well, I would have I would have candles that would burn and creepy music on in the background. And I did Ravenloft for about two years, especially while I was going through chemotherapy and radiation. Right. And I actually did an adventure based on von Richten called Bleak House, where you're attacked by these cerebral vampires, and they put you in an asylum. And make you wear these white masks that conceal your identity and they put numbers on the forehead. And I actually had my players make the masks and wear them through this. Wow. But yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. I miss Ravenloft. Um, <laughs> even though I, I did play it over Halloween, I wrote a three part game. Mm-hmm. And I guess it's just not me anymore. Really? Yeah. No? But um, what, what, why is that? I just don't have that same darkness okay. that was in my heart. Oh, okay. You know, I, I'm kind of trying to expel it. Oh, good. Well, that's, that's good. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think some kind of writing. I'm looking into writing some more crime and, you know, crime and noir stories. Right. And I just did another piece for Bloodbound Books. Nice. Yeah. And um, you just got the story accepted um, by uh, another anthology. It was Monst- uh, Zombie Works? Mo- yeah, Zombie Works Press, Monsterthology 2. Monsterthology Volume 2. Yeah. And that was about werewolves, right? 
Yeah, um, they they did. They wanted to do a classic uh, monster theme. Mm-hmm. You know, vampires, werewolves. Yeah, the Frankenstein's, um, Frankenstein's monsters. monsters. That's what I did. And that's what you did, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, I chose werewolves. Yeah. yeah. And they and they accepted it. So he loved the story. Very exciting. Yeah, he, he seemed to really like it. He loved the story. He, he definitely seemed to. Yeah. So I'm sent, happy about that. I sent mine, mm-hmm. and he hasn't responded, and I'm pretty sure it's because he just assumed that I would assume it was an acceptance. Right, right. <laughs> <'Cause>, exactly. <laughs> but it's... It's been episode 113. We're going to pause now to play a song that I found. Again, this is all uh, share Creative Commons license music that I play mm-hmm. a lot of times. I don't right. have permission. Right. You can play it on a show as long as you don't charge money for it. Right. That's kind of what we do. This is Titus 12 from Pipe Up Natty Red. It's called A Ghost Story on What Are You Afraid of? Horror and Paranormal Show on Parax Radio on Friday nights. And find us at the website at www.whatareyouafraidofpodcast.com to find a ton of ghost stories, articles about previous episodes, interviews, and it's just a really cool website. But this is a ghost story. Your source for everything paranormal. Parax. Dead demand to be heard, and on what are you afraid of horror and paranormal show, Philadelphia's horror home, we listen. New, true ghost stories, every episode, interviews with paranormal investigators, there is no supernatural. The natural world is just far greater than we can perceive. 
More information and expanded content at www.whatareyouafraidofpodcast.com. And follow us on Twitter at PF What Afraid of. Find us on all major podcast services, including iTunes, Google Play, and Spotify, iHeartRadio, or listen to us Fridays at 9 p.m. on the ParaX Radio Network. I'm horror author T. Fox Dunham. I'm horror author and filmmaker Phil Thomas. So, so what, what are you, are you afraid, afraid of? of? If you like what you hear, leave us a review on your preferred podcast service. What are you afraid of? Horror and paranormal shows. Speak to the dead. Paraxion. The worms crawl in, the worms crawl out. They crawl all over your dirty snout, your chest. My name is David Walton. I am a vocal performer for What Are You Afraid Of? Horror and Paranormal Show. And I have carried the burden of a terrible secret. I am actually what is offensively called a ghost. For years now, I have concealed my ectoplasmic existence from my friends and family, in fear of a common prejudice against ghosts, or what we like to call the disembodied. I have existed frightened of being discovered, unable to do physical acts that the embodied take for granted, such as walking a squirrel, or drinking a glass of vitamin E milk fresh squeezed from a whale. I grew depressed and even considered acts of self-harm or reincarnation, which is suicide for the disembodied. Such movies as Ghostbusters and its sequels drove my feelings of disenfranchisement and I began looking for help, only to encounter painful exorcisms in the houses I haunted. Then, I met two good people, it says here, Fox and Phil, at What Are You Afraid Of? Horror and Paranormal. And they helped me take control of my own life. Now, it is my choice whether I wish to make phantom bangs in the night, appear at the foot of your bed in darkness, or make your walls bleed. If you are a disembodied person like I am, and you're living a lie, what are you afraid of can help you too. They are on at 9pm on Friday nights at Para X Radio, leaving plenty of time for midnight haunting activities, and can be found on all major podcast services. Listen to their paranormal stories, interviews, humorous sketches and horror fiction, to know that you are not alone. And if you are a member of the embodied, don't forget, you are only a single heart attack or tumour away from becoming one of us. This is David Walton. See you on the other side. Or as I call it, this side. And that is the end of a perfect day. Your source for everything paranormal. Para S. Grey Matter Press presents a 21st century gothic from John C. Foster, the author of Mr. White. The Isle. There's a secret at the edge of the world. When a deadly menace threatens a remote island community, United States Marshal Virgil Bone digs into the island's macabre past. But some secrets should never be uncovered. Some curses should be believed, and some people will kill to keep it so. The Isle is available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and other fine retailers. Rat! Rat! Where are you going? I'm going back to the paranormal view, back where I belong. Please, please, take me with you. No, I'm through with everything here. I want to see if there's something left in life I haven't explored. Do you know what I'm talking about? Oh, Rat! Rhett, don't run to them. They talk about ghosts and hauntings, UFOs, and all kind of supernatural scary stuff. You'll never understand, will you, Scarlet? No! Well, that's your misfortune. Rhett! 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 Rhett, if you go, where shall I go? What shall I do? Frankly, my dear. Line! Oh, you you gotta be kidding. That's the Paranormal View with your host, Henry Foister, Jeffrey Gould, and Barbara Duncan. 
every Saturday night at 8 p.m. Eastern, exclusively on the Para-X Radio Network. All right, here we go. Quiet! Quiet! Roll up! Hello, everyone. I'm Andrew Willis, the host of Movies Now and Then. We're a podcast that looks at one new release film in theaters, then we compare and contrast it with a classic or underappreciated film from cinema history. We're not a traditional movie show in that we try to have a more conversational approach to our discussion. We want our listeners to be informed, engaged, and hopefully even entertained. If this sounds like something you might enjoy, give us a listen. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, or anywhere podcasts are found by searching Movies Now and Then. Well, this has been episode 113. Yes, it has. Yeah. You have fun? I had a great time. Yeah. It was a cool topic. I'm having a great time. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And it was neat that you were reading a book about the satanic panic. Yeah, it just... It just happened to coincide with what we're talking about, mm-hmm. you know, today on today's episode. You know, and if your car breaks down, I will get you a satanic mechanic. <laughs> <laughs> Rocky Har. You know what? Uh, I was listening to um, MMR mm-hmm. the other night, and you know how the clocks went yeah. forward, right? Thank God. Well, it was uh, it was about two a.m. I was driving home from somewhere, mm-hmm. and uh, the clocks hit two. And Guns N' Roses was playing. Okay, Sweet good. Child of Mine. Yeah, Sweet Child of Mine, the classic Guns N' Roses. Yeah, and it just cut off at mm-hmm. 2. And I'm like, what's going on? And, and then this weird voice came over the radio and said, we interrupt this song to bring you the time warp. <laughs> the, the, the time just jumped ahead one hour, and then the Rocky Hard time, time Warp song kicked in at, at 2, and it went, went boom, 2 to 3. Oh, like, my God. Yeah, yeah. That must <laughs> have been that, a lot of fun. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Because at first, I was like, what the heck's going on? You know? And then you realized <laughs> and then I realized was... that. I wonder how many people experience that. That's a lot of fun. Yeah, that was neat. (laughs) But it's been a good show. This has been episode 113, Folk Devils and Moral Panic. And you can find us at the website at www.whatareyouafraidofpodcast.com. Go check out A Time for Violence, the debut horror crime anthology coming out in 2019. It'll be out on May 1st. Go to the website and you can find that on Amazon where you can pre-order it. Mm -hmm. But uh, this has been great. This kind of got me back into the energy. Yes, yes. <laughs> I'm author T. Fox Dunham. And I am uh, filmmaker and author Phil Thomas. We interrupt the song to bring you the time warp. T. Fox Dunham lives in Philadelphia with his wife, Allison. He's a lymphoma survivor, cancer patient, modern bard, and historian. His first book, The Street Martyr, was published by Gutter Books. A major motion picture based on the book is being produced by Throughline Films. Destroying the tangible illusion of reality or searching for Andy Kaufman, a book about what it's like to be dying of cancer, was recently released from Perpetual Motion Machine Publishing, and Fox has a story in the next Stargate anthology from MGM and Fandemonium Books, Points of Origin. Fox is an active member of the Horror Writers Association, and he's had published hundreds of short stories and articles. His motto is Wrecking Civilization, one story at a time. Phil Thomas is an author and screenwriter from the suburbs of Philadelphia. His screenplays have been produced into feature films False Face and Always from Darkness and are available in major retailers such as Best Buy and Target as well as availability on Netflix and Amazon On Demand. His short films can be viewed on his YouTube channel, Film Zero Presents. He is a member of the International Association of Professional Writers and Editors, and he currently writes for Cultured Vultures, Game Skinny, and BloodyDisgusting.com. His first novel, The Poe Predicament, is being published in 2018 by Caliburn Press. The views expressed and the opinions given by the individual host and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Para-X, its affiliates, or its sponsors.